Okay, uh, welcome everyone back. Uh, today we are happy to have Davide Gaiotto, who's going to tell us about vertex operator algebra, vertex operators, and screening charges uh, as gauge invariant brain intersections in twisted M theory. Sorry, I, I was writing the title in a in in hurry and I didn't quite realize that it became quite a mouthful. Uh, uh, so I'm going to discuss some work I did with uh, Miroslav and uh, Jivan uh, on the twisted M theory and uh, brains in twisted M theory and application to vector spectral algebras. I will, as I know that Miroslav has given a rather detailed talk on the on the topic two months ago, so I will try to keep it a bit more general. So, uh, twisted M theory is probably not a familiar subject to most of the audience. Uh, the best analogy I can use to introduce it is uh, the B model of logical strings, uh, which might be more familiar to, to, to many of you. So, as you may recall, the way the B model occurs in string theory is as a way to study some protected terms in the effective action of uh, type 2b or type 2a string theory completely fine on, on the color BR. Uh, concretely to, to what you do to study the to, to introduce the B model is to study type 2b string theory on color BR times r4 in the presence of something called the subduagraph photon background which is a uh, the ground for the five for five form flux, which has uh, which is roughly proportional to the three form on the Calabiao and to a self dual two form on the four. Uh, once you're turning on, essentially turning on this uh, guy photon background, uh, gives an expectation value to a collection of F terms of protected terms in the supergravity effective action in four dimensions. There are a bunch of terms that look like gravity photon, like uh, field strengths to the sum power. Uh, multiplying some function of the scale of the complex structure of the Calabiao. Um, and people realize that topological string calculations in this background uh, could be sort of simplified. Instead of studying a, a string theory, a super string in 10 dimensions, you could just limit yourself to, topolo to something called a topological string, a string theory with target space of just the Calabiao, essentially. Uh, so that the problem became six dimensional, if you want. Uh, from the point of view of target space, the supergravity theory in 10 dimensions simplified to a six dimensional gravity or theory uh, called BCOV or Kodaira Spencer theory, uh, which is essentially a theory describing the fluctuations in complex structure of the Calabiao. So you get some kind of a Holomorphic gravity that only cares about complex structure with partition function computes some protected terms in the original physical theory. A slightly more modern perspective on this background is that uh, it's an example of uh, Costello's twisted supergravity uh, with an omega deformation turned on. On a background that looks like Calabiao times R4 with an omega deformation in two planes in R4. So I'm going to write C epsilon, C minus epsilon to say that this omega deformation involves an isometry of R4, which rotates a plane by epsilon and another plane by minus epsilon. And I will discuss a little bit, a little briefly, uh, what this supergravity means later on. But one of the main properties of this this supergravity is that if you couple it to a quantum field theory, it twists it and omega deforms it too if it's omega deformed. Uh, this was seen essentially originally by Uguri Wafa, which observed that you study physical brains on some which wrap a money from the Calabial times one of the two planes in R4, then they are converted automatically in topological brains, in brains of the topological string theory. And uh, you can re recover, for example, if the brain wrapped the whole Calabial, the topological brain uh, has a vo volume theory, which is holomorphic transamos theory. Holomorphic transamos theory is what you get if you omega deform the physical brain or volume theory, which is a, a dimensional uh, super Mills. Or if you study a brain that wraps a complex curve, uh, the physical theory is just the n equal four super Mills living on a D3 brain. 
and the omega deformation of that is a chiral algebra, uh, which has been very studied recently, and which is the work volume theory of a, of a D2 brain, top, the topological D2 brain. Uh, I should stress that, right, at first sight, right, you need topological string theory to do calculations in this in this setup. Um, Codera Spencer theory, which is what comes from the theory of gravity, is not normalizable, the same way as gravity is not normalizable. But actually, if I, if I understand correctly some results of Costello and others, um, Codera Spencer theory coupled to holomorphic transamos theory is uniquely normalizable. Meaning the counter terms of Codera Spencer theory are sort of uniquely fixed by the requirement that it can be coupled to holomorphic transamos theory. Which I find quite, quite funny because it seems to indicate that actually topological string theory is not needed at all, that you can do things just in Colara Spencer theory, if you understand this theorem sufficiently well. Now, isn't that yeah. what BCOV said? Um, did, did it say anything less than that? Uh, maybe I don't, don't remember it correctly. So, so is Kodara Spencer, suppose I just do calculations using Kodara Spencer without thinking about topological string theory. Can I make sense of it? Yeah, I, that, that's what I said. Yeah, they said okay. that it's the effective string field theory of, of topological B model. The same way um, ordinary transformation theory is topological string field theory of topological A model in a specific background, like, you know, with the brains on them. Base space of a cotangent. But wouldn't there be counter terms to be determined? I, I, I so just like in Simon's theory, I think they do they all it's go supposed away? to it's supposed to be the complete theory from what I understood. Okay, maybe I just misunderstood. Uh, it's perfectly possible. I thought that somehow Kodara Spencer theory would end up having some counter terms to be fixed. No, if, if you if you mean that it's like, you know, Einstein gravity versus string theory, it's not like that. No, it's supposed okay. to be the string field theory. No, I understand, but the closed string, is it a cubic closed string field theory? Yes. I mean, it, it so has a funny, that's... okay. I, I don't want to say that I, I completely have a feeling for the, for, for the Kodera Spencer theory. Um, it has this funny accent, but I, I think it's supposed to be complete. Isn't the Lagrangian highly nonlinear? Unlike John Simons. Yes, and the question is if all the terms in all these nonlinear terms are uh, undeformed quantum mechanically, or in some sense. I mean, if you can reabsorb all counter terms. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm no expert either. So I and even my understanding of Kevin's papers on the subject is limited. So I mean, the, the vertices. I completely misunderstood. If you're if, if if what they're saying is that the vertices reduce the vertices of a string theory, it's just that it reduces to a point particle theory, then there can't be any there can't be any ambiguities, right? Because in the same way you can't you know change Sorry. vertices in string theory. The and way I, I, I is that there was some cohomology problem of possible counter term model of possible theory definitions. Uh, and then this cohomology problem just in Colera Spencer theory per se did not have a unique solution, mm -hmm. but if you throw in Olamarfic and Simon's theory, then it does. But I, it's, it's a very superficial reading and... Uh, I, I Spencer I theory also contains an inverse propagator, if I remember correctly. Does, is that what helps the regularity of the theory? I mean, the action, right? It, it is some, it, it's not really local, is it? I mean, so Lomofi Chan Simons theory would not make sense at all without coupling it to Chan Simons. I think it has uh, anomalies and problems with that. With, sorry, without coupling to Kodara Spencer. Uh, but um, yeah, anyway, sorry, I, I, should, I should inform myself that my, better on, the, on this matter. So my understanding was that Kodara Spencer theory uh, are to complete would have some loop ambiguities which are fixed by coupling it to brains, but I might be I might be mistaken. Um, 
Okay. So in any case, I, I wanted to use this as an analogy just for twisted M theory. So uh, twisted M theory is defined in a similar manner, uh, except that you take the you replace the Calabi out directions with with uh, with the geometry, five dimensional geometry, which is locally something like R times C times C. So it has one real and two complex directions. And the you know, the, the R4 is replaced by R6. Uh, so um, essentially, and the analog, analog of the graphic photo on the ground is that you're turning on an H4 flux, which has, uh, you know, it has two legs in each of these two factors. It is essentially the holomorphic form on C and C and some uh, killer form on C on the C cube side. Um, and so, in the, so Kevin defined it uh, originally in a setup where to involve the four dimensional complex manifold, symplectic manifold, complex symplectic manifold actually, times G, a G2 manifold with some isometry. Uh, then you can replace G2 with R times Calabiao for, for simplicity. And then the simplest possible Calabiao is C3. Uh, but of course, the, the twisted and theory setup uh, is something you'd be interested in to study for any sort of toric Calabiao, not just C3. And David, where the M theory circle will be? It will be somewhere inside the Calabiao, or the R will be compact later? Uh, why do I need an M theory circle? <laughs> I don't know. There's always in theory for. I mean, just to, to compare. But, with I mean, the, in practice, for for several duality calculations that Kevin, I mean, to write, to write some of the results that Kevin derived, you use the internal one of the toric, one of the isometries of the Calabiao as as, as the. I see. So it's not going to be the first R, right? Uh, no. Usually not, at least. Uh, you could. Because one of the ways to think of it is this M theory lift of the type 2A construction for, you know, one of those Kapakumo Rafa stories when you have the kind of the resolved kind of fold with that. Um, right. Actually, yeah, now you make me wonder if I, if I, yeah, no, sorry. I don't know how to, I don't think I know much about the situation where the R is replaced by S1. Um, well, that's more, we'll see later. Maybe. Yes. So, anyway, so. In a, in a similar manner as what we said so for the B model, the, this 11 dimensional theory reduces to five dimensional theory, uh, which essentially describes a complex symplectic topological gravity. The local, you know, the local geometry must involve some kind of a locally constant symplectic, symplectic structure on C2 or on C4, which is locally constant along the R direction. Uh, and Kevin gave three or six, perhaps I should say, dual descriptions of this setup as a normal topological chan Simon theory, U1 chan Simon theory with a non commutativity turned on. And again, uh, Kevin proved a variety of non normalization theorems for this setup and uh, started describing how the volume theorems on five brains or on two brains would couple to this, uh, to this theory. And the main, the main subject of my work with, uh, with uh, Miroslav and, and Jivan has been to precisely study in, in more detail how do the vo vo volume theories of M-fibrance and M-tubrance interact with this or in this M3 theory setup and how do they, their supersymmetric intersections look like. Um, and right, I'll, while in the previous slide, we had a topological string behind we could use for calculations or uh, at least to to think about as a definition uh, here we have in theory so the vo vo volume theories on these fibers and tuberance are complicated strongly coupled conformative theories uh, and it's rather remarkable how the whole algebraic structure which emerges in this twisted M theory constrain strongly the properties of these uh, strongly coupled theories. Okay, so what are my motivations for this? There are sort of three different motivations. 
Um, first of all, I'm just curious about holomorphic twists or supersymmetric quantum field theories. Um, I think that's sort of the final frontier of supersymmetric quantum field theories in the sense that um, they are just the uh, most general twists uh, we can do to, to hope to extract some protected information from a, super, from a supersymmetric quantum field theory. And they are available in situations where you have relatively small amount of supersymmetry. So I think there is at least a chance that studying this holomorphic twist might capture some interesting physics. Um, second, I, I'm curious about twisted supergravity. I'm curious about this normalization theorem that uh, Kevin has been proposing. Uh, there had been several instances in the past years where people have discovered surprising non-renormalization non -renormalization theorems for supergravities, uh, where divergences would appear, I mean, would not appear where you would expect them to appear uh, in supergravity, say in any late supergravity. And well, I'm curious to see if either to use supergravity or just even the idea of coupling to uh, probe objects in order to uh, constrain further counter terms might be might give some interesting results. For example, I don't know, you could ask if uh, if the counter terms of an equal a supergravity are constrained by requiring it to couple to super particle to a closer client mode of some sort. Uh, also, these two supergravities the theories seem to be uh, relevant to study protected subsectors in holography. So there seem to be a variety of situations where um, some twist of the boundary theory can be compared with the uh, twist of supergravity on the ground. And finally, I'm just curious about vertex operator algebras and supersymmetric theories, about the relation between these two topics. Um, uh, this twisted and theory stuff seems to be a very natural place to think about AGT and, uh, and other similar relationships. Uh, in our work, we have we encountered a physical interpretation or an interior interpretation for a variety of interesting vertex algebra constructions, including things like the Coulomb gas realization of, uh, of Dinosaur or W algebras. And so, this is also something that seems interesting. Uh, any questions? Uh, hi, David. Um, can you say a bit more about uh, what is this? What does it mean? A four-dimensional symplectic complex and one-dimensional topological. Right. So I actually would love to know exactly which five-dimensional geometries can be used as a background of twisted M theory. Uh, I don't quite know it and. This has created me trouble in trying to, for example, use twisted and theory for holographic purposes. I would love to know how to put this real complex symplectic structure on a DS3 times S2 or on a DS2 times S3, for example. Uh, but I don't know at the moment. Um, but if you have, if you have just a definition it, of what it means, real complex symplectic structure, like just. just... So, in, in, so that I can give some example, right? One, so if you take R times C2 or R times another uh, complex symplectic manifold seem to be a good background, at least classically. Uh, you want to be able to turn on non-commutativity on this complex symplectic manifold. So perhaps you want a complex symplectic manifold which has a nice quantization. Uh, then you can start building geometries where perhaps you have interfaces where the comp along where at some point in R your complex symplectic manifold changes as some symplectomorphism that is gluing up you know R plus times uh, times M1 and R minus times M2. These I also think are likely uh, good backgrounds for for the for this twisted theory. Let, let me ask you the question, which I let me ask you the question, which I which I maybe want to ask, which is suppose I have a five manifold, which is contact, then uh, then there'll be one direction. You know, I, I fix a contact one point, say, and there's one direction um, everywhere, and transverse to that one direction, uh, canonically I have something symplectic. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, do, do you need this kind of product structure or if say in such a geometry, I was able to add a complex structure on that transverse symplectic direction, that would be good enough for you? I do not know. So I, I just, at first sight, I would say yes. Mm. I can pop, I can try to write, I, I think one can write down a, well, there is a matter of turning on the non-commutativity, uh, which might require a little thinking. For, for okay. generalizations of AGT, presumably you in the very least want to be able to replace C times C by something like a tangent space to a Riemann surface, right? Uh, right, if I wanted to literally do um, AGT, probably yes, but I'm not sure that sort of the curve version of, you know, the, the, the global version of AGT finds a good home, home in the student theory. I would think it should. Possibly. Do you mean the, the, the 5D version? So like... Um, both. 5D version, we do need that circle though. Um, no, both. I think you can, uh, you should be able to, uh, re well, both. So you can modify, I think, uh, C times C by a cotangent space to a Riemann surface. And mm -hmm. you can also modify C times C by uh, like C star times C star and have a Riemann surface inside it. Right. That would be the sort of the 5D version. And I think both of these uh, do make sense. It, they almost certainly make sense. For the former, I don't see an obvious obstruction in the sense that this star C can be quantized to, to, to the modules on, on the curve. Uh, so I can imagine it, it should be doable. And I agree with you, R times C star times C star is a nice background and one should be able to think about them five brains wrapping, for example, a tree neon in C star times C star. And this probably, and this very likely will give you things like the, uh, the tree leg intertwiner of dim. I, I think it most certainly does. Yes, so uh, I was actually thinking about trying to figure it out like, a bit better last week uh, to, to which to this statement. Uh, I think clear. actually the easiest place to start, the, sort of the most transparent one would be the C star times C star version. But... Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, a lot of the intertwiners we study with Miroslav seem to live nicely to C star times C star. And C star, C star is in a sense even a bit more symmetric. Uh, I, one thing that is a bit painful is that, at least at first, uh, was painful for me is that, uh, so in, in the setup with Miroslav, we have very, very different looking algebras, the describing and shoe brains, the describing and five brains. When you work on C star and C star, it's, it's dim all over the place. Uh, then your Hara uh, all over the place. But I'm now coming to the realization that there is, uh, there are some important constraints on the central extensions of, of, of DIM uh, that play a role in the story. So uh, the m brain algebra is like non-extended DIM, uh, while the five brain algebras have to do with DIM with only one of the central extensions turned on perhaps. I mean, the one that has the basic fog modules. So presumably just keeping, you know, keeping carefully track of the central extensions, one can, can, work, uh, can work out the whole story. Uh, it's work in progress. So yes, yeah, so replacing C times C with nice complex surfaces is, is a nice step. Um, replacing the, C3 with the Tori Calabiao is the other important direction to extend the story. And at the moment, I think we understand reasonably well what happens if the Tori Calabiao has no internal faces in the Tori diagram. And the, the big, the, the important frontier is to figure out what to do when there are internal faces. And I'll come back to this, you know, to-do list at the end of the, at the end of the talk. Any other questions? Okay, uh, so 
Right, so let me just give a very quick reminder of what twisting supersymmetric theory means. Uh, this, I feel, be a bit boring for most of the audience, but you know, just in case there are some students, uh, <laughs> or perhaps you know, people who do real physics. Uh, anyway, uh, so um, the idea is that if when you when you when you when you consider a um, supersymmetric quantum field theory with enough uh, supersymmetry, you can look for generators of, uh, super, of a supersymmetry transformations, which are nilpotent, which squares to zero. And then you can take one of these generators, and we call it as Q, and add it to the BRST charge, or treat it as a BRST charge. Which means that intuitively, you're just focusing your attention on local operators and on questions which are invariant under the action of this supersymmetry. And treating this, this supersymmetry as a BRST charge sort of guarantees mm -hmm. that you have a protected subsector which does not talk with anything else, just in the same way as the BRST formalism in, in, in gauge theory guarantees you that the physical observables do not get mixed with any unphysical um, things built out of the ghosts. Um, so it, this procedure simplifies by some degree the, the original theory and uh, Compute some pieces of the original theory. Mm -hmm. uh, there are there are sort of two different types of twists you can do. Um, if you're when you look at a supersymmetry algebra, uh, you can ask what happens if you commute Q with some other supercharges. So you'll get some translations. If all translations are are Q exact and in the commute are in the image of this map then that means that translations are a gauge symmetry of the twist theory. So the precise position of operator is a gauge artifact and drops out of the calculation. Uh, if you have an holomorphic twist, when uh, although not all translations are exact, all anti-holomorphic translations are exact, which means that the anti-holomorphic dependence of local operators is a gauge artifact now. And correlation functions are roughly holomorphic. Um, now, twists are useful if you can somehow control the dependence on the couplings on the RG scale of your problem. Uh, so, although you can define a variety of twists, it's not clear at the moment you know which of these are actually useful uh, in this sense. But Typically, uh, if your dependence on the, if your theory is topological, if the theory is topological or morphic, you're it means that you're losing a lot of the information about the metric. Uh, you can imagine that, you know, maybe it will depend on the complex structure, but probably not on the scale of the metric. So there is at least a good chance that what you're computing is RG covariant, if not RG invariant. And so, you might be able to learn something about the low energy physics from calculations done in the UV. So let me just sh show some examples of theories which admit holomorphic twists. So 3D, 3D and equal to theories admit an holomorphic topological twist. So they can be so twist where the dependence on, on one of the positions is topological and on the remaining two is holomorphic. Uh, for d n equal one, theories admit an holomorphic twist. And for d n equal one, theories admit again an holomorphic topological twist. And these are all, you know, physical theories. You know, they, they have very non trivial uh, physics that we would love to understand. These three identical two theories can have anions in low energy physics and have a variety of interesting critical points. For d n equal one, theories have confinement, critical, you know, symmetry, car symmetry breaking. Uh, five dynamical one theories have UV fixed points that we don't really understand. So for all of these questions, you might try to ask what, what is visible in the twisted theory. Um, and another point that I find interesting is that very often the holomorphic twist in a superconformal field theory picks out the operators which, which would contribute to the superconformal index. And the superconformal index of theories with low supersymmetry. Uh, involves rather interesting states. For example, recently people uh, figured out that you 
you can actually see black hole degeneracy in the superconformal index for the uh, for the theories. And so, um, with a bit of holography in mind, I can imagine that these holomorphic twists might might see something interesting uh, about the supersymmetry of black holes. Um, now, twisted supergravity is a variant. It's a slight modification of the idea of, 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 uh, super of twisting a super a rigid supersymmetric theory. Uh, in supergravity, you cannot think about a, you cannot say just I pick a supercharge because the supersymmetry is local, not global. Um, but there is a, an analogous procedure in twist McKevin where you look for a solution of uh, essentially for what you can talk, call a, a super gauss per ground. So you take one of the ghosts for the supersymmetries, which is a boson, and you look for a verb which solves the equations of motion. And uh, you sort of turn on this verb. Because the super ghost multiplies the super current inside the BST charge, roughly, uh, turning on this, uh, this constant verb for the super ghost, the testing perturbation theory is in fact very similar to twisting, uh, twisting the theory. And doing this procedure, as I was mentioning, automatically twists the quantum field theory, any quantum field theory coupled to the supergravity theory. Uh, and right, Kevin has been studying some of these types of supergravities and he has been proposing some normal, normal normalization theorems. And right, both in the rigid case and in the uh, supersymmetry, in the supergravity case, there's a notion of omega deformation, which is a the formation of a twisted theory, which uh, localizes to the fixed point of some isometries. Essentially, you, you modify the theory so that the supercharge doesn't square to zero, but it squares to an isometry and work equivalently that isometry. So now to understand the twisted supergravity of the ground, perhaps a good way is to think about the fact that if you have M theory compared to Fadon Calabial, you get a five dimensional equal one super supersymmetric theory. So the twisted, twisted and theory background uh, is essentially the lomorphic topological twist of that 5D theory. As I mentioned, the, the local geometry is R times C2. Um, and you can get line defects, topological line defects in the real direction by wrapping M2 brains on a curve in the Calabial. You can get M5 brain, you can get holomorphic surface defects by wrapping M5 brains on a surface in the Calabial. And I should immediately say that we know very little about what will happen for a generic Calabial. You know, what's the holomorphic topological twist in, in a generic Calabial the ground? Uh, the, the, the best understood the ground is C3 uh, with an omega formation which rotates the three planes uh, independently, except that you want to preserve the lomorphic, the, the, the top form. So you rotate the, the, the sum of the rotation parameters is zero. Um, and so Kevin proposed that there should be a dual gauge theory description valid in a regime where one of the parameters is much smaller than the other. And this dual gauge theory description uh, involves this sort of just Simon's action or, uh, which is which uh, only involves the, the real and anthelomorphic components of the connection. Uh, for a U1 connection with a non commutativity uh, turned on in, in C2. So the, the addition of some action is evaluated using the star product in, in C2. Now, this dual description breaks completely the symmetry between these. Uh, these three factors in C3. And there is this sort of non trivial uh, duality that this action should give the same answer if I permute epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and minus, one, minus epsilon 1, and minus epsilon 2. The line defects or surface defects that you get uh, in this setup from a true brains and five brains wrapping toric uh, divisors in C3. Uh, definitely break at first sight this permutation symmetry. For example, if I wrap an M2 brain on, on the a single M2 brains on these C, C factors, I can get either Wilson line of charge one 
it was some line of charge minus one or something looks like an instant on particle uh, for this non-commutative U1 Higgs theory. Uh, if I look at an M5 brain, it might look like a toothed surface of charge one, a toothed surface of charge minus one, or an order defect where you just couple the U1 Gitch theory to a Karaf fermion in should be. And again, so this statement is I'll told definitions look very different. Quantum mechanical will give the same answer up to permuting the epsilon i parameters. Now, this this uh, word line theories of so volume theories can be studied uh, directly by using the volume theory of a single and sure, a single and five, which are theories we understand very well, right? And the volume theory of a single and true brain is just uh, a bunch of scalar fields describing its position. The volume theory of a single and five brain is, uh, again, it's a, it's, it's a, it just is a self dual true form uh, gauge theory. Plus some scalars and fermions. Now, if you look at stacks of M5 brains or stacks of M2 brains, uh, the story becomes com more complicated. In the physical theory, a stack of NN5 brains supports a six dimensional CFT coupled to 11 dimensional supergravity. And if you go beyond the three level, we don't really have an idea what the couplings look like. So there will be some effective action for 11 dimensional supergravity and some effective couplings which involve polynomial index for gravity fields and local operators on the, in the CFD, uh, subject to who knows what constraints in order to ensure supersymmetry. Now, when you turn, when you couple, when you turn on the twisted and, and theory of the ground, uh, we know that these theories and then five brains should get omega deformed. Now there is a conjecture which is closely related to AGT that the omega deformation of this six-dimensional theory uh, is a Karl algebra, which is the W algebra, uh, Wn, the sort of the Karl algebra with n fields of dimension one, two, three, four, five, all the way to n. This is a conjecture, um, which in a sense gets verified or even proved if you want in twisted in theory, if you think about it uh, optimistically. So, uh, you can ask, how do I couple a Karal algebra to this twisted supergravity background? Can you explain how, uh, I mean, uh, th there are some proofs of some statements of AGT. Why is, uh, what, what is, which angle does this give you? Uh, or in which sense do you, do you say this, is, this gives you a proof? Well, what I mean is that, um, at least in principle, just starting from the five-dimensional chain Samos action, one could, and using this uh, causal duality description of the couplings uh, given by Kevin, one can argue that in order for a vertex algebra V to, to be coupled to the, to the twisted supergravity, I need to have a map from W infinity to the vertex algebra. What is V? So suppose I have some surface defects because the volume theory is some V. Ultimately, it's going to be WN or something, or one of the corner vertex algebras. But in abstractly, let's just say I'm trying to, I'm given a HP theory with Karal algebra V, and I want to couple it to, the, to this Yuan Chan Samos theory. So, Kevin's statement is that essentially, in order to give you this coupling, I need to give a vertex algebra map from W infinity to V. So, essentially, the generators of W infinity are telling you which currents in V are coupled to which. Uh, derivatives of the connection in five dimensions. And you know, vertex algebra are rather rigid. So if I tell you that I have a map from W infinity to the vertex algebra, I'm telling you quite a bit about the vertex algebra, especially by if I tell you what the, you know, what the central charge of, of this uh, of W infinity is going to be. So uh, I can imagine, you know, at some point that convincing myself that the only, you know, that the central charge was N, the only thing that I could really land on was WN. But anyway, I'm not saying it's a true, I'm just saying that at the very least, uh, whatever lives on the M5 brain, uh, the, the U1 theory only talks to the WN subalgebra. So at the very least, it tells you that there is WN or a truncation of WN 
inside the 6D theory. Maybe the Kerr algebra is bigger, but there is at least this. Uh, and then you can sort of use this as a seed for a bootstrap program <laughs> for 62 comma zero theories, perhaps. Um, uh, similarly, if you if you consider three stacks of um, five brains, uh, at some point with Miroslav, like we worked out that the, at the intersection of these three stacks, there should be this corner vertex algebras. Uh, and again, it just so happens that these corner vertex algebras are a truncation of W infinity. And so uh, the, our conjecture is supported by the fact that you can actually couple these corner vertex algebras to the uh, twisted and theory setup. Now, once you once you once you think about see when when uh, can I say this? If I just give the CFT on a stack of five brains, uh, the fact that I can separate them five brains is a statement about the vacuum of the CFT, and so the idea that I can assemble. Uh, a stack of fibrins from individual and fibrins, uh, it's some statement about, uh, about what the uh, what the theory of several and fibrins look like on, on a Coulomb branch or on a tensor branch where the fibrins are separating. Um, and in that context, I mean, I still do not understand if that sort of idea can be used within quantum field theory to derive the Karel algebra on, on the stack of M5 brains from the Karel algebra of individual M5 brains. So this is, an, this is a question that um, I've encountered a few times in the past. That is, if I know, you know, if I know the Higgs branch of a theory, is that enough, or the Coulomb branch, is that enough to reconstruct the Karel algebra of the theory? At the moment uh, is not clear, although there is some there are some examples worked out of free field realizations worked out by Rastelli and others, which uh, are um, evocative. Now, you would need to know that you can end M2 brains on, on separated M5 brains. And I, I mean, I think that's kind of what you will be telling us today, right? That as soon as you understand sort of one M2 brain ending on an M5 brain, right? I don't know if a single M2 brain theory already knows that, that this must be possible, but once it does, you, it should know everything. Uh, the perspective I would like to, to first present is that uh, once you couple it to twisted M theory, um, then this tells you a little bit more, or at least it gives you an important piece of information. Uh, it tells you that the currents for W infinity had to be built from the currents of W infinity in the individual substacks. And you can argue that this has to be governed by some universal coproduct, which only knows about, uh, which doesn't really care about the environments themselves. It's just a property of the five dimensions in some theory or the other twisted and theory setup. So I think the twisted and theory setup tells you that W infinity has a coproduct and that this coproduct should be used when you stack together and five minutes. And if you apply to a collection of N and fibrins, you end up with a free field realization WN uh, from N and, and boson. I mean, if you want the, the, the product, is really how you define uh, WN. Uh, this is a piece of the Coulomb gas, gas construction. The Coulomb gas construction is a little bit more than that. It tells you how to build the currents out of N free bosons. It also tells you that these currents commute with some screening charges, and that these screening charges can be used to compute conformal blocks. And one of the results of the, of the work with Miroslav is that I believe we understand a bit better what these screening charges are in this twisted and theory context uh, in terms of M2 brain stretch between the five brains. So, but, but you can't separate the free field realization of WN from knowing about the screening charges. Because at the point you don't know about the screening charges, then you just have like copies of. No, you can, I mean, writing the currents as polynomials in the free boson currents, it's tells you the W infinity algebra, right? 
but it has the problem that it does not allow you to compute conformal blocks in a nice way. Uh, to do conformal blocks, you really need to turn to, 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 to realize that these generators commute to this local screening charges of dimension one, which you can do internet on cycles to get more general conformal blocks. And, uh, and right, using, using this M5 brain perspectives, we, we realized that if you take M2 brains, stretch between them five brains, they precisely give you local operators which commute to the W infinity generators. Um, so you can you can sort of see the Coulomb gas construction as a situation where you move in the Higgs branch, you separate your brains, and some vortices, some M2 brains appear stretched between them, uh, which such that you know that you know, if you include all the vortex sectors, you get the whole the whole theory. Uh, anyway, uh, again, this is just to say that uh, a lot of the structures of WN and W infinity emerge naturally from the twisted material setup. And presumably, then, if you apply this technique to other Calabiaos and other uh, Five-dimensional geometries, you can produce systematically analogous construction for what construction for whatever vertex algebras, whatever algebras you encounter there. What do you use to compute this co-product? In which side of which? Uh, yeah, how, how, how do you determine what it is? Uh, so with the, the way the way we approach the problem with Miroslav is that at some point uh, we we convince ourselves that the, and argue that the, the mu operator represents the intersection between an M2 brain and an M5 brain. Um, and then you can derive the coproduct from the from the from the mu operator. So we don't compute directly the coproduct. In principle, you know, one could compute the coproduct from 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 Feynman diagrams in this U U one transformal scheme. Uh, but uh, I don't think it's the most reasonable way to do so. But the existence of a coproduct follows on the existence of twisted material. And, and so to speak, at the level of mathematics, it's a conjecture that the coproduct. That I would compute from the Feynman diagrams in the Z1 theory, and that's a well defined yes. thing, is the same as the co product that you obtain by, uh, by yes. the route that you went. And I believe it's a, it's a precise conjecture uh, in the sense that these Feynman diagrams are just you know, systematically yeah. computable. Thanks. So there is a similar story for the M2 brains. Uh, where again, so in, in that case, the, the omega deformation of it, you have a three-dimensional conformal field theory living on, on the on the tubings of volume, and the omega deformation gives you quantum mechanics, a topological quantum mechanics, essentially a, a, an algebra. Uh, and you know, Kevin, Kevin argued that this algebra is uh, essentially called something the spherical Hecke algebra. Uh, there are many different ways to think about. It. It's essentially just the quantization of the of the moduli space of n instantons in, in F4, and you want instantons in F4, uh, non commutative you want instantons in F4. Another way you can think about it, which we found very useful, is that it's generated by the Calogero Hamiltonian uh, for n particles, the rational Calogero Hamiltonian, and the symmetric polynomials in the positions. So you take this sort of collection of generators, you commute them with, with each other and you produce a big algebra, uh, which is this spherical Hecker algebra. And again, using this causal duality of Kevin's, coupling these algebras to twisted supergravity requires you to find a map from some universal algebra, we just call A, uh, it's a kind of a shifted Youngian, um, and uh, whatever quantum mechanical system you want to put on your line defect. And um, part of our objectives, which he, which, he, which he realized, was to find which algebras, which line theories live at the intersection of three stacks of M2 brains. 
the analog of the, the corner vertex algebras. So this corner vertex algebra had to do with three stacks of M fives. And we wanted to find what are the algebras which arise on three stacks of M twos. And although we have not, we have not, I don't think we still have fully characterized those algebras, we can give the analog of this Calogero Hamiltonian uh, that generates them. So it's sort of a bizarre variant of the Calogero Hamiltonian, which involves three collections of positions uh, and some, some potential. The coupling in Calogero is the epsilon? Or uh, yeah, the, well, the coupling is some some collect some combination of the epsilon one, epsilon two, and epsilon three. <coughs> In the world that I'm familiar with, um, uh, Kozul duality is a statement that some pair of algebras basically contain the same information. Which pair of algebras are we talking about here? Just, just so here, uh, what's going on is the following: In the bulk, there is a operator algebra. Uh, the operators of the of this if you look at this one Simon's theory, uh, the only op operate, the only local operators are really polynomials in derivatives of a ghost for the U1 gauge field. So there is an algebra which is generated by some degree one generators, which are the derivatives of this ghost, you know, holomorphic derivatives. The one to the n, the two to the n of C. And these local operators, as you multiply them in the topological direction, will form some algebra. Uh, the causal dual of this algebra is this algebra A. So uh, there is the statement that morphisms from A to B are the same as uh, ways to use the descent relation to couple B to the uh, to the to the bulk. So to in a, in a sense to uh, to couple a, a to, to make a whistle line. What do you do? Uh, you you take your gauge connection and you contract it with some generators of your uh, of your of your volume line theory. Uh, if I apply the send, this is the same as contracting the C ghost with the generators of your algebra. So a coupling is roughly bilinear between the operator algebra of the bulk and B. And causal duality converts this bilinear into this map from A to B. And uh, this, you know, the original bilinear had to satisfy a Maria Cartan equation in order to be, uh, to, you know, to, to be gauge invariant. And this Maria Cartan equation becomes the statement that this map is an algebra map. And we had an analogous such uh, relation for the M5 rings as well. That's correct. Although the, the precise definition of causal dualities for vertex operator algebras is not quite uh, written down, you should think that you have these ghosts. Now, instead of multiplying them in the topological direction, I'm, you, know, you can define operations, you integrate them around each other, sort of a differential graded OPE. So you have now a differential graded vertex algebra with generators of those number one, which are the derivatives. Now they are the derivatives of the ghost. I mean, I'm sort of multiplying them on one complex plane and, 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 the, and the fields are the, the normal derivatives. And so the derivatives of C in the, in the orthogonal direction. I, and presumably this, uh, Again, the couplings of between this, this bulk and, and, and some degrees of freedom V can be expressed as this vertex algebra map between the causal dual and V. Uh, and so, see, this W infinity has fields of dimension, scaling dimension one, two, three, four, five. And these are sort of dual to the normal derivatives of the C ghost, uh, which have increasingly neg negative uh, dimension. It, 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 is, is there some reason why this definition is not written down? I mean, I remember uh, more than a year ago, I, I saw you guys in um, Toronto. Uh, I, I think it is, I mean, see, 
if I just say formally, I take the causal dual of a, of a holomorphic factorization algebra, presumably that, that means something to. No, because it's like a new notion of causal dual. It's not somehow the old notion. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, I mean, if I just define the causal dual as something with a property that morphism from that is the same as more cartan elements in the, in the other one. Yes, but then it's not obvious that the thing exists. I guess it's not obvious that it's the same as the right in the view of causal duality. There is definition in terms of endomorphisms of C as a module. Right? I I don't know if something like that here. But 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 I, if I, I don't I, use I, that as a definition, I just say I I look for, I write down a more cartan equation. Yeah. And I want this. You know, I want I want M C of the first algebra to be mod of the second or something. I, I agree you can write that, but then uh, you, you, would, you would either, I mean, you're claiming that um, you have calculated what that causal dual, dual algebra is and it should be W infinity. I did not claim that I calculated it. Uh, so, so, so this, is some, this is some sort of uh, uh, mathematically speaking, conjecture that the causal dual of some I mean, of some coupling is is this W infinity. I mean, somehow I think that I think it I understand from what Kevin has been doing is that, in a sense, when you do your Feynman diagram calculations, it's easier to compute the causal dual of your operator algebra than the operator algebra itself. So, you know, computing the OPE of operators with Feynman diagrams is a pain. Uh, computing the violation of gauge invariance for a defect is perhaps more intuitive. And so, the, the, you know, it, Kevin does not do a calculation of the algebra and then apply causal duality. It's more like the calculations he does produce the causal dual of the algebra of observables. So I said, you know, what it does is literally, you know, I couple my theory to a defect uh, with some of these, and then I check if this coupling preserves BLST symmetry if there is an anomaly. And 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 from this procedure, you can produce W infinity. Uh, that should be the case. Uh, I, I see, but, but but that calculation is not written down somewhere. That in no, this so way, okay, w I think comes it out. is at a very leading order for an order defect, which means that the central charge of W infinity is turned off. Uh, to do it properly, you would have to work for defects where you have some degrees of freedom placed on top of a tooth defect. Uh, and where, where there is okay. a certain flux. And that, that flux will become the, uh, the central charge of the uh, W infinity. So yeah, it's it. Yeah, I don't. It's not the calculation that has been done, but. but but you can imagine how you would do it. I mean, there's, there's yes. a certain calculation you should do, and then the result should be W infinity. That's, that's, a, right. that's right. In a sense, uh, part of my question in starting this project was that I had two calculations which I know in principle could be done, and one gives me W infinity, and the other gives me A, and. How do I know that, you know, is there anything I can do having A and having W infinity to convince myself that the two calculations are com compatible with each other? Uh, see, in a, in a purely topological theory, I would expect multiplying operators in this direction and multiplying them in this direction to be essentially the same. But here it's a little bit more complicated in this holomorphic topological theory. I don't, I don't know what paper to open to tell me uh, what's the, Consistent, what sort of consistency should I expect between the homomorphic and topological operations? And, you know, I, I can start building up some thoughts, you know, maybe, I, you know, I should have a co co product, the homomorphic co product and the, and the topological co product must have some relation, but it was not quite clear at all to me what the relation should be. So the main problem. The main question that guided me was, 
tie together A and W infinity in some way, which uh, could, could convince us that whole structure makes sense. Uh, right, and so, so I, as just mentioned, uh, in a similar way as there is a coproduct on W infinity, which governs fusion of the defects along the topological direction, uh, you expect also to have a coproduct that fuses line defects along the holomorphic direction. But now, because this direction is holomorphic, so the, 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 the separation should matter. So the coproduct sort of should map A to A tensor A extended by a formal parameter, uh, which tells you the separation, essentially. Um, and so we, we sort of we figure out what the coproduct should be by looking at the Calogero uh, realization of the algebra, and then use it to produce the more general truncations. And we get this, you know, this funny calogero like thing with three stacks of, uh, of planes. Um, so, right, so after studying M shoes and M files, the next natural thing to do is to look at intersections, locations where an M shoe brain meets an M5 brain, crosses it, or perhaps ends on it. So, um, we know from M theory that, that such intersections should exist. And should be compatible with coupling to spare gravity. So this is not an obvious statement, right? Even if you convince, if I convince myself that I can couple these two CFTs to super gravity in a supersymmetric way, the fact that there is a local operator which which can talk to both CFTs and is gauge invariant in in super gravity is not obvious. So, right, so the question is, what are the constraints on gauge invariance of the local operators? And then does the existence of gauge invariance of local operators tell us anything about uh, A and W infinity? So after some thinking, we convinced ourselves that the gauge invariance of local operators is controlled by a sort of a mixed coproduct. So intuitively, imagine doing a gauge variation at this operator. At the leading order, you would do it by integrating the BRST current on a sphere surrounding your operator. You would get various contribution to the gauge variation. In particular, you get some contribution uh, from the gauge variation of the, of the, of the line defect, from the, so the more cartan element that defines the line defect, and for the more cartan element that defines the surface defect, and the one that defines the bottom line defect. And so, uh, Intuitively, at the linear order, the, the relation will be something like the variation delta one should be this, or delta two, sorry, should be the sum of the variations delta one and delta three. Uh, what if, when you start introducing Feynman diagrams in the story, it becomes more complicated. You know, I could have a Feynman, a Feynman diagram which gives him an anomaly which receives contributions from multiple copies of the more cartan element on the, on the various defects. So we convinced ourselves that the correct way to write the gauge variance condition was that the operator acting from the bottom is a very equals a very specific multilinear built out of the operators acting from the top and from the surface. So in, in more concretely, that there is a map from A to A times W infinity and that the gauge invariant local operator intertwines the, the action of A from the bottom and the coproduct of the actions of A and W infinity from the top. So it's like an intertwiner, a mixed intertwiner between A, A, and W infinity. Uh, what's the question? Is there a question? Sorry. Awesome. So, so this applies when. Um, uh... There's some issue of orientation of your M2 brains and M5 brains. So M2 brains, there are some that cannot end, and then there are some that can end. Yes. The story you're telling us now is about those that can. That no, yet they are crossed. I have one from the top and one from the bottom, so it's just crossing. Okay. You can and I, it by by eliminating one of the two. Okay. And uh, right. Okay. So uh, you could and then in principle just have a, like a half M2 brain. Yes. And there'll be similar considerations there. Yes. So how do you how do you figure out this coproduct? Like, how did you figure out what it's supposed to be? 
Where, where does this come from? Right. Uh, we essentially guessed it. Uh, so uh, we, we, you know, we looked at very simple examples of intersections and tried to see if they satisfied relations that look like this. And uh, you know, we looked at them for a while. We stirred them a bit more, them a bit more, and then we we brought something that seemed reasonable. Uh, and of course, you need to convince yourself that this is an actual product. Um, this uh, this can be done in various ways, um, but part of the trick is that both A and W infinity are related to the affine Youngian in different ways. And I, I believe you can sort of uh, recover this coproduct from the coproduct of the affine Youngian. But in practice, what we did is to verify that this coproduct intertwines the mu operator. The mu operator is an intertwiner for this coproduct. And then automatically it sort of uh, means that it So uh, it, it, you can use it to convince yourself that um, this co that this coproduct actually works. In, in this formula you've written a to a tensor w infinity, are those two a's the same or are those two different a's? It's the same a. So there is a universal algebra. No, no. What, what I mean is, is one of them the one from the top and the other one the one from the bottom, or are they both from the bottom? No, so what I want is that a generator of A acting from the bottom should be the same as the coproduct image acting from the top. So I um, so o, o has a let me put it so O has a left action of A, a right action of A, and it's the W infinity module. <coughs> <coughs> so the space where all lives. And so I can write it down an equation where uh, a generator of A acting from the right gives me the same answer as the coproduct image of the generator acting from the left as a combination of the A action and the W infinity action. So I should have written formula, but because I was trying to complement uh, the previous talks. So so, 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 in other words, on one side, the how do say uh, maybe on the left, you say the a there is the a from the bottom, and on the right, yeah, maybe maybe we can just explain again. So, uh, so let, let me pretend that the coproduct is just the stupid coproduct where I okay. generate. Let me call it t one one here that is mapped to t one one plus j j you know, J, J1, whatever. Okay. Some random generators in A and W infinity. Then the equation- But, 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 but actually, e e even then, that core product it has to do only with the, um, only with one side or already that has to do with both sides? So I write an equation that said something like, you know, T, T, T plus J acting from the left for, on O, equals t acting from the right or not. OK. And in particular, for this half defects, you just have a map from a to double infinity, right? Absolutely, that's right. So a, there is a map from a to, to, to c, to, to, the trivial, to the trivial algebra, uh, which corresponds to the trivial defect. And so in particular, this gets you map from a to double infinity. And can you can you build the coproduct? I mean, uh, can you build the coproduct only out of the map from A to W infinity, or do you need somehow? Um... So what we did was to sort of write the wrap the map write the map from A to W infinity, and then add a small correction to make it into a coproduct, okay. and check if it still works. But I don't think you can derive it. So I've been thinking of how to derive this coproduct properly. And uh, I can, in, uh, 
in particular, I've been trying to think of how to map, how to relate these two statements I might do in C star and C star, where I'm using this, this, this Dean UR algebra. Um, so see, this in this setup I'm describing now, I sort of have a local operator placed at the origin of the complex plane. So I have something which is a module for the for W infinity and also for the algebra. And it's a bimodule for the algebra. Mm. Now, if I if I sort of apply a state operator map and I work on a cylinder instead of the plane, because I want to put a C star, then I should think about the vertex operator instead of instead of a state. And now I would have a W infinity action from the left and from the right. So I could write the gauge invariant of gave this so that I could so W infinity algebra is sort of a a, a silly coproduct from W infinity to W infinity times W infinity opposite, which is you know acting on the vertex operator it is the same as acting from the left plus something acting from the right. So uh, now we start having something which has four legs, you know, two A legs and two W infinity legs. And it starts looking like a like an art matrix. Uh, so the first step will be to show that this coproduct here is actually secretly expressed in an art matrix for the vertex operator. And then when you when you go from uh, W infinity to Q, Q the form W infinity, this should be just like the art matrix between uh, two representation, you know, two between the, I mean, for 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 Dean. The matrix for them specialized to the case where one central charge is zero and the other is, uh, is not. So I think that if I wanted to really derive this, this coproduct, I would do something like start from the matrix of dim, go down to the non q form, and try to sort of convince myself that this is actually written in terms of the, you know, use the state operator map to, to, to convert it to something like that. I, you know, I've not, I've not, I've not done anything in detail. I mean, I wish I had other simple examples of holomorphic topological theories to work with. I mean, this is not quite the simplest example I <laughs> to employ. Uh, now, Kevin's Fordition Samos theory is another nice example of holomorphic topological theory. Kevin has been studying the line defects of the theory in great detail. Uh, I would love to understand the surface defects of the theory, the holomorphic defects of the theory, and perhaps find similar similar story where the Youngian plays around with the with the vertex algebra. I have some ideas, but the, the, the picture is still not clear to me. But hopefully, this is the general structure in these holomorphic topological uh, theories. There, are, there is a coproduct from the topological algebra to the topological algebra tensor with algebra of modes or the lomorphic algebra. Um, and I mean, if I just, if I think in terms of causal duality, uh, right, the, the dual of this should be something like a prod, you know, a product instead of a coproduct. And I think this is time to realize the situation where I have, an, I have an operator along the real line and then I have an operator. Uh, so I, I'm bringing up, I'm trying to act, I'm acting with operators away from the real line to operators on the real line by uh, doing an OPE. But again, I'm not sure. I've, I would really like to have a clean understanding on how to. Uh, let me just make the same thing for the topological setup. Suppose we have an E2 algebra, and which in particular includes any one algebra on the vertical direction and any one algebra on the horizontal direction. And then I apply causal duality to these two algebras. So I get a vertical causal dual algebra and a horizontal causal dual algebra. Uh, what do they have with each What do they have to do with each other? I think what you can find is that you'll have an R matrix of some sort, 
compatible with horizontal and vertical products. And this should be the analog of that, especially if I replace C with C star and I go to a vertex operator. Okay. So I think I'm going a bit over time. Um, oh, uh, David, we are, I, I thought uh, you were warned about this. We are actually, uh, this oh, is I'm happy to keep really going. a totally okay. informal seminar. So, uh, and, right. yeah. Plus with the, time shift, with the time shift, right? I could go for, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, will, I will run out of energy much earlier than you, so. Okay, I, I don't want to tell you like how long we've gone on for at times, so, so not to feel pressure, so, but uh, th there is no time pressure generally, so. Okay, very good. So, all right, so uh, from uh, AGT or from the corner of the algebra story, we had some expectations of what, of examples of gauge invariant junctions, right? In particular, we expected that the single M2 ending on, on M5s should be, should end on a fundamental degenerate field or an anti-fundamental degenerate field. So the things that are labeled by a single box, like the, you know, the, the one the sort of the Jerry fields is satisfied BPC equation uh, in the W algebra. And we also had a vague idea that perhaps the, the, the intersection of N2 and N5 could have something to do with the Muir operator, the Muir operator. And so a lot of the work we did was to, to show that these extensions are correct. And these three objects are indeed intertwiner for this coproduct. And once you know that they are intertwiners for this coproduct, uh, you realize that uh, you can start fusing them holomorphically or topologically, and you, you will keep getting new, uh, new nice junctions. Um, and so you get both some self consistency checks. For example, we realized that some of the mirror operators could be obtained just by fusing the generic fields. And also, you get these, these other constructions I was mentioning the fact that the scaling charges to the Coulomb gas construction are M2 brain stretch between M5 brains. You get the, you understand why the collagen model is related to vertex operator algebras and so on. Uh, right, so we have a bunch of pictures. <laughs> in, in a sense, essentially what you get is, is the diagrammatic understanding of some algebraic structures in this, in this, uh, in this W infinity or, or spherical like algebras. Uh, you can do operations, so you know, fuse lines, fuse surfaces, and all of these are precise meaning in terms of products uh, and relationships. Um, uh, can right. you explain to us what the pictures meant and how to think about them? <laughs> well, for example, right, I, take, I can take a degenerate operator where uh, M2 brain ends on the top, and one with M2 brains end on the bottom, and you can fuse them. You can convince yourself that the OPE uh, is actually secretly the same as one of the mirror operators uh, that describe the, inter the, the intersection of M2 and M5. Um, because there are, it's, so there are, you sort of fix your M2 fiber and then you vary the M2 brain. There are three different mirror operators. Uh, one is the familiar ones of del plus j. Uh, the other ones are pseudo differential operators, a bit more complicated, built out of a current. I'm confused at a very basic level. Are these pictures in three dimensions or five dimensions? So, although the whole thing has five dimensions, we always looked at the three-dimensional subspace. So we ah. put our M5 brains always up in the same seat. Uh, I would love to figure out what happens when I start playing with all different directions, but things look a bit tricky. Uh, perhaps in the, in, the, in the DIM case, it's a bit easier. Uh, so first I'll look there. But anyway, so everything here is in R times C. Can you explain the top right? Sorry? Explain the picture on the top right. So how the cop product acts is a bit confusing. So like how about we start with the top left? <laughs> left is kind of clear, right? So uh, the top left 
she will express the fact that if I fuse two surface defects and I have two gauge invariant junctions, the gauge invariant junctions will fuse to a, to a new junction. So uh, on the left hand side, I the gauge invariance condition for this whole thing involves uh, uh, you know, I act from the bottom, I rewrite it as an action from the middle plus something from the surface. And then this action from the middle, I rewrite it as an action from the bottom here. So it becomes an action from the top plus an action from the surface. So you see, I apply the coproduct once and then I apply it again. I mean, apply the mix of coproduct twice. I start from an element of A, it gets mapped to an element of A I mean, to a baline, to a multilinear of elements of A and, and the first defect, second defect, sorry. And then I apply it again. This should give me the same constraint as if I had done the calculation on the right, where I, I map it to the current, you know, I use the, the mixed coproduct once, and then I write the W infinity currents as the, as the bilinear uh, or the, or mutalinear or, or the currents of the two defects. Just uh, slow down a little bit. Um, the reason there's an identity in double infinity on the left mm -hmm. is that uh, in the second step, uh, when you do it a second time, uh, you don't do anything to the double infinity mm -hmm. generator That's on fine. the first one. Okay. That's now, fine. can you explain slower the second view of looking about it, thinking about I, it? So I, I do the coproduct, and then I just Remind myself that the W infinity generator, so this fused object, where the coproduct, so the original W infinity generator, so S1 and S2. So I apply the, co the mixed coproduct, and then I apply the coproduct to W infinity. And so I get a sort of an associativity relation between the mixed coproduct and the W infinity coproduct. So, so, so uh, let, let me see if I understand what these what, what what this slide is supposed to be telling me is the axioms for a vertex algebra value in E one algebra and whatever that notion is supposed to be it, it, it's this item right at the very least the top ones yes uh, should be some of the axioms so I have I should have a, a VOA coproduct a meromorphic algebra coproduct a mixed coproduct. And they should satisfy these associativity relations. And um, I, and I can almost imagine that these figures are a you know like almost mathematical proof of the statement that if I have a holomorphic topological theory in three dimensions, then I get this kind of algebraic structure out of it. Yes. That's right. And they should and come in the right picture. So why is it the delta A A on the left and delta A W infinity on the right? So like how should there be the top to bottom? So I, hope I, didn't, I, I hope I didn't switch them around, but right. So this should be um, let me see. Uh, yes, so suppose I'm trying to act to the Again, you should think about it like this. You, you do a gauge transformation from the bottom and you're trying to map it to a gauge transformation on the top and on, and on the outside. So I start by acting on the bottom where I had a fusion of two line defects. I rewrite it as a gauge transformation of the two individual defects using the coproduct for A, the meromorphic coproduct for A. And then I apply the mixed coproduct to rewrite it as something acting from the top and something acting from the defect. And I apply it to both, to both factors. So, so I apply delta AA, and then to each factor of A, I apply the micro product. OK. And, and now I have, to not, you know, I have a little loop around one of the defects and a little loop around the other defect. Are you saying that subjunctions of defects make sense in string theory? Sorry? That the, are you saying that junctions of M2 brains the way you draw them actually makes sense in string theory? Well, I'm sorry, we shouldn't have, I should not have drawn them as a junction. It's really just to say the two parallel defects. Mm -hmm. uh, I see. 
if it was, you know, if we had drawn it the same way as the left, I would just say two parallel difference. Okay. You, you don't actually say that yeah. the M2 brains can confuse. You just look at them together. Yes. That's right. As one object. I mean, as, as yeah. Okay. One theory. Yes. We, of two of two brains. Right. Okay. And similarly, in the bottom picture, I apply the mixed coproduct. Uh, and then I apply the coproduct of the algebra. And this other delta here is not the coproduct of W infinity. It's just the statement that if I have something that wraps, you know, if I, if I look at, if I do a contour integral around two points, I can write it as a sum of the contour integral around one point and around the other point. So, yeah, really, I mean, it would have probably been better to write these pictures as just something going through. It, it, it's hard to, to find. Okay, great, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, okay. Right, in the middle, I'm, I'm just showing this fact that you can reconstruct some URAs from fusing vertex, the general vertex operators. And more generally, uh, you know, if I fuse miuras for several lines, I'll get a miura for the combination of the lines. If I fuse miuras for a combination of surfaces, I'll get the miura for the combined surface. So the thing on the right, on the top, on the bottom right, is just pretty much the definition of WN algebra. Uh, you take, you com there is a combination, you know, there is a collection of differential operators like del plus J, one, del plus G2, del plus G3. You compose it, you get a big differential operator, del to the N plus J1, del to the minus one, plus G2, plus, you know, stress tensor times del to the minus two. Anyway, so a polynomial with coefficients of the generators of WN. Um, so now uh, you say one should think about having actually three classes of, of, of um, Mura operators. Yes. Um, so from one of them, you can recover the double algebra. How about yeah. from the other two? So the other two just give you the same, the same. So it's actually funny that the W algebra is, or W infinity algebra is often defined by the Mura construction. But the Mura construction breaks the symmetry between the epsilon i's. So it's rather a non-trivial fact that you actually have three different mural constructions of W infinity and they give you the same answer. Uh, on the bottom left, we are just saying that if you, instead of composing these differential operators, uh, you take the OPE, meaning now you have something like del one plus J of Z one, del two plus J of Z two, del three plus J of Z three with the same J's, and you take their OPE, uh, you get now a big differential operators in, in N variables coupled to one current. And this actually, if you, if you expand it out, you find the Calogero Hamiltonian. So there is a, there is a miura that couples uh, just a current algebra with the Calogero, uh, with, a, with a spherical Hecke algebra. So there is a miura operator value in the spherical Hecke algebra. which explains a lot of relations between Calogero and, and UA. Um, right. Yeah, so, so some of these structures I had un were anticipated in the paper with, with uh, Jivan, but in that paper we made a, we were confused uh, about the central charges of the fine Youngian. So uh, w, the W infinity algebra is, can be identified with the fine Youngian where a certain central generator is set to one or to be non zero. Uh, in, the, in that paper, we were a bit confused and instead we had said, we made some statements where, that, uh, where we propose using roughly the same products, but with the central generator turned off. So, uh, so I would just make have, give a warning if you're reading the paper with Jivan. Uh, whenever you say you see as making conjectures about the interaction between the M2 brain algebra and M5 brain algebra, there is that crucial uh, mistake about the central term. 
So, um, okay, so what to do next? Right, I want to understand different orientations in C2. I would like to understand the Q deformation story from, uh, from R times C star times C star. And I would like to understand what happens if I change the inner, the internal Calabial. So, I mean, Miroslav more or less uh, understands what to do when, when you have no internal faces. Then you use the, uh, you know, instead of the uh, W infinity algebra, you use sort of matrix generalizations of W infinity algebra. And we're, you know, we, we have been checking what happens on them true brains. Uh, I think there is a story involving spin calogero models. What's the big unknown is what happens to your internal faces. Now, you're, you know, if you have a, you know, if you have a Calabria with internal faces, you're getting things like five dimensional H2 gauge theory, you're getting actual gauge theories in five dimensions, and then presumably the holomorphic topological twist uh, of these five dimensional gauge theories. So, my hope is that just, you know, once you understand how to assemble the building blocks, we'll be able to learn how the holomorphic topological twist of five dimensional gauge theories work. Uh, starting from this from these simpler uh, setups. Another thing that I'm curious about is interfaces where something more drastic happens at some point at some location along the real line. Uh, because these interfaces will give you will be essentially the topological twi the holomorphic twist. So I don't know why I wrote topological it's supposed to be a holomorphic twist of domain walls which are for one uh, symmetry. So again, there is a chance that, you know, as we keep adding building blocks, we might learn things about the homomorphic twist of four dimensional one theories, sort of a geometric engineering of four dimensional equal one theories and the homomorphic twist. Um, Can you explain this a little more? I didn't understand those last bit. So, which kind of the, where did it, yeah, uh, I mean, in, in some sense already, in, you do get interesting things to happen in, in this one dimension, right? Because you have M2 brains that end on M5 brains and so forth. What, are, what else are you trying to do? So you could have domain walls where something happens to either the Calabial or, yeah, or something happens to the Calabial as you cross the domain wall. Essentially, it's a way to build toric G2 manifolds as as toric calabials with some events happening along the real line. And in turn, this could tell you things about four dinical one theories. I mean, at some point I had studied things like by fundamental domain walls for SC2 gauge theory in five dimensions. And there were some fun stories about their duality properties. Um, I could imagine at some point learning how to engineer these domain walls in twisted and theory. Um, other things you could think about is, for example, you know, maybe I can have a domain wall where I go from C star times C star to C times C or C times C star. Maybe those could explain some pretty bizarre relations that I see in the literature between uh, the Q deform uh, between DIM the, 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 and, and, uh, and a fine Youngian. So there are statements that you can embed the fine Youngian inside the uh, double it, uh, the DIM algebra. I don't know why, but maybe that's related to a domain wall between C and C and C star and C star. In which context does this arise? I don't know. It was in a paper by Zimbaluk, and I, I don't know why was it interesting, but it seemed a very physically it seemed a very strange statement to me. That the that the cuneiform story and the non cuneiform story should be related in some way. It's actually not that strange. Uh, this is something. Well, I'm not sure if that's the particular realization of this, but uh, in one context, I am familiar with this. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, if you study just two dimensional mirror symmetry, yes, then um, what uh, mathematicians uh, know very well is, and I guess it's obvious physically as well, that um, say you study Coulomb branch of a four dimensional gauge theory in a circle. Mm -hmm. um, then as a, as a sigma model for n equals to two theory, that space is essentially self mirror. So mm -hmm. it's kind of hypercalar rotation is mirror symmetry. Yes, yes. But say, it's, it's, no, 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 I want to study mirror symmetry for a, for a Coulomb branch in, of a three dimensional gauge theory. Mm -hmm. so 
Then something interesting happens. On one side, obviously, you get a Coulomb branch of a three-dimensional gauge theory. Yes. On the other side, uh, you get a Coulomb branch of a four-dimensional gauge theory plus a superpotential. Mm -hmm. And that's just something, again, it's very well understood fact of sigma models about what happens if you try to you know, squeeze some cycles that it somehow yeah. generate superpotentials. And so that's an instance where I, I know that these two worlds come mm -hmm. together. So I was wondering if perhaps one can have a domain world between C-star, you know, there are, there are simple ectomorphisms of between C and C and C-star and C-star and perhaps they can be used to define a, a domain world or something. Uh, I, I do not know for sure, but um, at least uh, that would be a possibility or, you know, sit or situations with toric Calabiao changes. Uh, I, I don't know. There must be also some duality in string theory that would sort of interchange the circle like corresponding to the Q deformation versus the affine, um, well, you know, star action that comes in with the affine uh, Yang gen, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Same thing happens, say, in, say, Q operas and affine operas. They both correspond to the same quantum. Yeah, effect. I was finding confusing for us, for example, the fact that um, on one hand, this story that we are studying has definite relationships to uh, the topological vertex for C3, if C3 is clearly internal space, uh, right? For example, the, uh, the modules of this, uh, of the infinity, which was character is the McMahon function or the uh, topological vertex uh, uh, partition function. On the other hand, if you work with C star times C star, you can start looking at this sort of surface curves in C star times C star, like the trinium, you know, things which have, you know, one leg along a C star, one leg another C star, and then a, a leg in the diagonal C star of the two. And these might be related to the intertwiners for the for dim, which I understand has something to do with the refined topological vertex. So now the toric diagram seems to be drawn on in, in C star times C star, not in C times C times C. So anyway, there, there are it's probably one of the situations where uh, you can have so many different duality frames uh, and you can find different connections you know, in equivalent ways to relate this picture to uh, the to topological string picture. Could you tell us a little bit about, um, that's something Miroslav did not actually have time to tell us about, um, the, the connection with, um, of this story to uh, Pandre Pande, uh, mm -hmm. Thomas? Yes. So I, I don't think I have slides, but I can yep. I can say some things. So right. So this oh, sorry, as I was saying, uh, a specialization of this coproduct is just a map from A to W infinity. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and one way to think about this map is that. Take the W infinity algebra and take the modes of the W infinity algebra, which are annihilating the vacuum. Those are not an algebra. Because if you take the commutator, you get normal order products which annihilate the vacuum, but that you know are sums of products of things which individually do not annihilate the vacuum. Uh, this map sort of modifies the, the the, the positive modes of W infinity by some extra normal order things in such a way that now they form an algebra. And, and then suppose that you're trying to build representations which are not the vacuum by saying how the positive modes of W infinity are acting on the, on the sort of level zero things. Then uh, it's tricky to do it in W infinity itself, because again, the positive modes don't commute to positive modes. But instead, you can try to say how the image of A in W infinity is acting on your highest weight vector. And so you can use this map from A to W infinity to induce representations. 
uh, take a representation of A and induce a representation of infinity. And, and then you can look at the box counting representations of W infinity, the one that are obtained by you know, melting a crystal. And you can ask, are these induced representations? And the answer is yes. It, it takes a little bit of work though. Uh, so if you look at the melting crystal representations at first sight, it doesn't look like there is, you know, some sub module of A from which other things can be induced. Uh, you don't look something, you know, you, you just had this base vectors labeled by part 3D partitions and it doesn't look like there are some 3D partitions which are better than others. But uh, w infinity, the W infinity algebra has a funny automorphism which shifts the sign of the odd currents. This is a very simple automorphism for W infinity, but it looks very weird in the fine Youngian. So the box counting picture for representations of W infinity uh, has to do with a uh, fine Youngian presentation of W infinity. So essentially you have these representations that you build out of melting crystals and you can apply this automorphism of W infinity to get some other representations. Uh, you can try to give a melting crystal representation of presentation of these dual things. Uh, so, sorry, you could, so you have this melting crystal representation of the Youngian. You look at it as a representation of W infinity. You dualize it, you apply this, this, this simple automorphism, and then you look at again at, at it as a representation of the Youngian. And it's not a standard box counting representation anymore after you do that. But uh, if you stare at it for a while, you realize that it looks like a, a funny thing where you are either adding, either adding boxes in a quadrant or doing something else somewhere else. Uh, sort of adding or removing boxes in some, dual, in some auxiliary space, which is not Nocturne. Uh, and so now you have this sort of nice subspace where I don't add anything in the quadrant but I only do things to this auxiliary space. And these are representations of A. And these are the Pandari Pandit Thomas counting. So the things you do in this auxiliary subspace, in this auxiliary space, are the things you would use to count Pandari Pandit Thomas invariants. Um, it used to be true, uh, sorry. <laughs> The, the way I remember the Pandre Pandit Thomas Thor is that this is supposed to be a, a different, well, this was um, a, a different choice of stability condition. Yes. Gives you, so do, do, you under, do you understand why this happens with the, the story as you told us? Is it? So I'm not sure, though I wonder if, this, if the two chambers are related somehow by this automorphism of of W infinity in some way, I do not know. Uh, the fact that they are a, a so the Pandre Pandre Thomas invariants are supposed to have to do with uh, M2 brains. I, I mean, what, what do you think is a physical description of the Pandre Pandre Thomas invariants? I actually don't know what the good answer is to this question. So Donald so Thomas invariants are intuitively the zero brains bound to it's it's just a choice of stability you know i'm i'm somewhat rusty but i think it was a different stability condition i don't remember if it was like um maybe vivek should know this do you remember vivek uh, yeah sure um i mean maybe the thing to say is that uh you, you know you you fix when you do this counting, you fix some turn character of which uh, which things you're going to count. And so the, the usual story is that the this these PT ones um, they have to do with the what you would call D six, D two, D zero. In other words, the turn character is like you know something. Anyway, D six, D two, D zero, and. Uh, 
then what Mina is saying is also correct that when you do this counting, you have to make some decision about stability. And that decision influences who you count and who you don't. Right, so in the PT chamber, you don't include the zeros, or do you? Uh, you, you do, but I mean, I, I'll just say specifically what you count. You count, um, you take some curve, and on that curve, you have um, a line bundle and a section of that line bundle. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, so the D0 is, you know, like the zero locus of that section of that line bundle. Right, so the zeros are all bound to them true in a sense. So the Yeah, that's right. So is it, you're looking at the true with flux? Uh, could be, yeah. Yeah, the line bundle, um, with a, a curve with a line bundle is exuberant yeah. with a bit of flux. An ordinary topological vertex also counts the zero, the two, the six. Right. So is it- now um, are, but, but now there are also individual the zeros which move about. Yeah, it, 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 in the end for, 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 the, for the C3 vertex, it only affected- uh, So, I mean, right, the, 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 the two partition function differ by McMahon yeah. function factor, right? Yeah. Which I guess is this change of stability condition. There is a whole crossing. Yeah. And the, the individual the zeros detach from the DC. I don't know. Not. You're losing the zero and the six bound states. Yeah. I think it's, but, well, I guess it's a little bit. At the very least, what I can say is that it's not so strange that the algebra A acts on configurations of M2 brains. Because the algebra A is supposed to describe uh, what's going on on M2 brains. Um, but like, I would like to have a better. Do, do you have a, pure, a purely box counting description of this? Um... Out this a out this algebra a action. Yes. Uh, what what is it? Uh, what do you mean? I, I mean what I, is the description? I mean, I I, I I don't know how to say how the generators of a. I mean, what do you mean? I there is some box. There are some box configurations which are allowed and label states and the generators of A uh, act on that by adding or removing box, boxes. Is it manifest yeah, that you get yeah, Padrepanda, yeah. Thomas? Maybe one way of asking is that. Is it manifest that you get Padrepanda, Thomas, or it's something you have to check? Um, no, it's not manifest. I mean, sorry. Um, we, we conject so that you can get, I mean, the box, the, the box configurations that you use are the ones that are used to to do box counting of Panda Panda Thomas. Uh, I, 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 I Let me comment on that maybe. Uh, so you can argue uh, that something that you get is going to have the character uh, of whatever you're going to get uh, is going to be a module with a character uh, that that has the description in terms of the Pandre Pandre Thomas topological vertex uh, box, counting, box counting. And you can sit down and try to write down action of the generators of the affine angion. That's something that we have done uh, at least to a large extent. And you can just show that you can uh, write down a consistent, consistent uh, formulas for the action of the generators of the affine angion. Well, show means by hand at the first few levels. Uh, but but, but no, you're not, you're... that's not fair. That's not fair. I mean, we didn't check all the actions. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Uh, We've checked a lot. But, but for, we but, checked but, a lot of actions. For example, I mean, Miroslav checked a lot of actions. <laughs> like the, 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 the best thing you could possibly ask for would be to implement this action of the affine Yangian by some correspondences and Pandre Pandre Thomas moduli yeah. spaces. But, uh, and this may be not done, but somehow you could imagine going in that direction. Absolutely. I believe that can be done. I believe it just requires some work, but it, it can most probably be, be done. Okay. And it's more or less straightforward.
So can I uh, ask a question, which is a, a more of a fantasy, actually? Uh, in this uh, case of uh, 3D n equal to 2, where you're constructing uh, or where you get uh, anions, is it possible to non-abelianize them or to construct non-abelian anions? Uh, so, so the moment very little, there are very few situations where the homophily topological twist has been described in detail. Mm -hmm. uh, with Kevin and Tudor, we paid some attention to the situation where you put a boundary condition, and then you ask which Karel algebra lives at the boundary. Mm -hmm. uh, try to compute it with algebraic geometric tools. Mm -hmm. If you do that to a pure 3D n equal to this, just Simon's theory, which as a physical theory, you know, it's, it's identical to standard Chen Simon's theory, then you recover the algebraic description, the algebraic geometric description of WCW models. I see. Which essentially tells you that what model or tensor category you get from Chen Simon's theory. I see. Um, okay. Now I, I can imagine doing but the same for a purity matter. Yeah, so the churn Simons that you get is a U1? Or no, 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 any churn Simon. I see, shouldn't, okay. But that still doesn't produce a non-abelian anion. But churn Simon, as you choose, churn Simons does non-abelian anions. Ah, okay, you're telling me how to produce, okay, good. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, so I'm saying uh, for pure churn Simons theory, you, you find a very cute algebraic geometric calculation of the theory of anions, uh, of the WCW, mm -hmm. it, or that WCW model, which in turn tells you which anions are done. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. I mean, I'd have to understand that uh, uh, a little better, but I really thought it would be just fun to con try to construct non abelian anions. But if they're already there because of this churn Simon thing, that would be uh, interesting to look at. Thank you. I mean, it's a fun calculation because. Uh, the monopole operators, the boundary monopole operators play an important role in the, in the analysis. Um, figuring out how to work with, with monopole operators for physicists is still a little tricky, but uh, mathematicians have found good ways to think about it uh, in, in connection to the BMN, to the, to the, the, when they're trying to figure out how to do, uh, you know, hacker modifications or mm -hmm. to do the, the column branches of 3D gauge theories. Uh, and so, you know, you, there, are, there are some games you can play with the fine Grassmannian, which uh, uh, seem to work. And so, you know, you find, uh, you find the WCW model as some cohomology of some line bundle on the fine Grassmannian. Very cool. Is this calculation written up, the, uh, the algebra geometric calculation that you're telling about, which? Uh, yeah, reasonably so in, in, in the paper with Tudor and Kevin. I see. Okay. And, you know, we would love to be able to extend to, to the situation with matter. Uh, we, I mean, we've, we've wrote down the, the, you know, when you have matter, you now have a cohomology of some Complicated bundle on the Fangas manual, and we have not computed it. But, uh, in principle, yeah. there is a definition. But your Grassmannian and the line bundle on it is explicit. Yes. It's just a matter of computing. It's not, a, it's just a matter yes. of time. It's not, okay. That's right. And I'd be curious to know if one can get some interesting physics out of it. Uh, or you can study A model with quasitropic brains. Mm -hmm. Or you can study, I guess, A model yeah. with quasitropic brains. Right. Yeah, and, and yeah, it would be nice to also have direct calculations in the bulk, not just going to the boundary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, right, so this, this, this should be one of, you know, my, much richer examples of, you know, holomorphic topological theories. By the way, uh, another reason one should study holomorphic topological theories is because I have, have a strong conviction that uh, the only way to get symplectic duality from physics is to pass through the homof through the topological twist. Uh, if you if you are a symplectic duality aficionado, but in symplectic duality there is a, a comp 
a relation between categories of objects attached to the Higgs branch or Coulomb branch of 3DN equal four theories. Uh, the, you know, the, individual thing, the individual things on the two sides can be computed from the topological twist, like a Pustin Witten twist or its mirror. But in order to make simplicity duality work, uh, mathematicians had to put in by hand an extra U1 grading uh, and then apply it to yeah. the causal duality. And this extra U1 grading is just not there in the topologically twisted theories, but it's there in the holomorphic twist, mm -hmm. the holomorphic topological twist. So I'm hoping that at some point uh, somebody will give a good definition of the holomorphic topological uh, twist uh, structure and then say, okay, ah, it's clear that uh, mirror symmetry for that is simply like duality. Perhaps. <laughs> okay, sure. uh, can, can I ask you about this four manifold? So uh, you you were using you wanted to use C two or C star times C star, mm -hmm. why not like you know elliptic curve or uh, K three surface or? Oh, absolutely. Um, anything that is quantizable should work. Uh, I could imagine, for example, some Sklyanin algebra version of this. Yeah. C P two minus uh, elliptic curve. Absolutely. Uh, I, I guess the M. Schubert algebra would be something like the quantization of the Hebrew scheme of points on this CP2 minus, minus elliptic curve. I don't know if this object is known. Uh, you know, is there is there a sort of n particle versions version of the Sklyanin uh, algebra? Uh, I don't know. I, I think. Uh, It's possible Kinsev and Seudelman know the answer to that question because they've been considering that, uh, I mean, quantization of that geometry very seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't know. And then the, 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 the test, if this makes sense, would be if, if the symmetry, once you do the large end limit, does the symmetry between the epsilon i parameters come back? Right, because it starts, we start with, your, with a quantization of your manifold with quantization parameters, say h bar. And then you take n, uh, you know, n particles on that quantized manifold, uh, and uh, you, you send n to n, you, you take n to be very large. Uh, you you should be sorry. What was the other parameter? Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I, I cannot say it. Uh, Right, sorry, you want the Hilbert scheme of points on, on that manifold uh, with the resolution parameter, presumably. I don't know if it's can, you know, this inverse scheme of points on, on C2 or C star and C star has a resolution. Uh, I don't know if that's the case for this. What does it mean, resolution? Well, meaning, you know, there are singularities when points collide. Uh, uh, and you the Hilbert scheme is the resolution. Yes, yes, that's right, that's right. So the Hilbert scheme has a parameter, which is the deform, deformation parameter. And then there is the quantization parameter. Oh, and okay. the finite end, that they are not symmetric, but in the larger end limit, the deformation and quantization parameters should, should be on the same footing. Uh, I see, I see. In the oh. <laughs> I lost you. Which end are we talking about here? Uh, the number of entry brains. Sorry. So I, I imagine that the algebra that lives on a bunch of Schubrens in R times a manifold would be the quantization of the Hilbert scheme of points on that manifold. And, and you, you think that at, at large n you'll recover the absolute, don't M2 brains per definition break the symmetry? Yes. And then I, need, I can take the, the number of Schubrens to be large and try to make it a continuous parameter. Think the symmetry I mean, will be I recovered in the limit? I can look for a sort of a universal algebra which has maps into each of these finite n algebras. And there will be some central parameter which goes to n over h bar. Something like that. And then this, this large n algebra should presumably be 
democratic in, in, the, in, the, in the three directions. Why, why is that the case? That it but, should exist, it's maybe believable, but why should it be democratic? Uh, because it should be the algebra, it should just be the algebra of the bulk theory. It should be the causal, causal dual of the, of the algebra of local operator. Or perhaps what I should say is that there should be a democratic algebra which treats the two parameters symmetrically and which has morphisms into all the finite and algebras. So from the... Um, that, that's from the thing I should really say. From the perspective of this dinghy Yohara, right? There is, uh, there is another set of objects in the game once you're in C star times C star, which are the momenta of M theory and the torus. Mm -hmm. That's the torus in the C star times C star. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's an SL2Z acting on this. Yes. So these momenta, I think are the, the dinghy are how algebra generators. So that's a, a kind of a new ingredient. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, it's not obvious to me that M2 brains themselves would disappear. So, so then you I are, mean, if you, yes. sorry, if you want a bulk algebra, that's the bulk algebra. The bulk yes. algebra is that of, of momenta. Yes. Then you, but it has two, so the Dingyo ha has two central generators. Is this what you're calling momenta? No, 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 sorry. So uh, I'm trying to now just describe the generators of the Dingyo yes. Hara, right? The, yeah, um, no, right, right. So they are two yeah. integers, that's right. Yeah. So the generators are just, I mean, basically the, the, the corresponding states are just uh, right. momenta so, on, the, uh, on the, sorry. So, so okay, in, if you were to go to type 2B, it would be like PQ strings. Mm -hmm. If yes. your M2 brains become D3 brains. That's but right. in M so theory, I, they just come from momenta. What I would say is that the M2 brain algebra corresponds to the Ding Yohara with all the central elements turned off. Which means that you know both the horizontal and the vertical are commuting. Right. So that there is a vertical Heisenberg algebra and an horizontal Heisenberg algebra, right? Uh, with which look like a U1 current algebra with some level. So there's a vertical level and a horizontal level. Uh, so I think you need to turn them both off to get them true by an algebra. Sure. And so that's just, now that's something which is SL to Z variant, which makes sense because the, the true brains, you know, wrap R, they don't know anything about C star and C star, I meaning they, they, they treat them democratically. On the other hand, and, if you look at it. Mm -hmm. at, at the same time, the epsilons that remembered which plane them two brains yeah. are as, as something else. Yes, and it's democratic in the epsilons. So then your Hara depends on Q1, Q2, and Q3, but on the democratic way. I see. So you, you, you're, you're, you, you think that at large and your miracles will recover, recover? Yeah, I think yeah, it's known that, the, that if you take the McMahon operator, difference operators, and the symmetric polynomials in the variables, uh, you, in the large and limit, you get in your Hara with the central elements turned off, but. How do we reconcile this with things we know about M2 brains, which is that if you take the large end limit of M2 brains, at least you're left with some flux and geometry back reacts and like lots of interesting things do happen. They don't, don't just disappear. Uh, well, this, it's important that this large end limit is a misnomer. N is not taken to be large. Uh, is actually taken to be infinitesimal. So uh, there is a parameter which is n over epsilon one, and you keep the parameter fixed as you send. So I'm not, I'm not saying it very well, but there is a slight difference between holographies large n and the large n I'm talking about, although they're related. Uh, um, I mean, Kevin this, this, would definitely say that the, the fact that the large n limit of the Aventuberian algebra is the bulk algebra is a manifestation of holography. It didn't have to be the case. So 
is true that strictly speaking, all I could say is that there is a map from A to the algebra of N and two brains for all N. <clears throat> but A could be much bigger, it could be uh, much smaller. I mean, Are you perhaps just saying that um, that is Dingy O'Hara is like the al algebra of monopole operators, roughly in, well, M2 brains will become D3 brains in this mm -hmm. Dingy O'Hara world. And the, the you know, momenta of M theory circle, they, they become your monopole operators, which are the Yeah, I mean, Dingy, the Dingy O'Hara Dingy is just the quantization of the, of the Coulomb branch, right, of MD3 MD brains wrapping a circle. For in the large n limit. I mean, you know, the the operator, the generator labeled by A B is literally a you know a toothed operator of charge A and Wilson operator of charge B. Exactly. Uh, Which up. that's right. Which come from these objects in M theory. I mean that that's what yes. I mean at the moment. And at finite end, these objects have relations. But these relations go away in Ding Yohara. Like, like you know, in in S, in, S, in, in U1 gauge theory, right? A Wilson yeah. line of charge two is the square of Wilson line of charge one. But this is not true at right. one. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. So in that sense, so that's what large n limit means here. It's just just that there are some relations that occur at finite n that you throw away. In, in, in other words, I think you, you somehow want to, um, I mean, as a, the, the Coulomb branch algebra on M2 brains is a representation of the, a particular representation of, of more general Dingy O'Hara with the gen, specific central charges. Yes. Uh, which I guess happens when you bring these, um, you know, PQ strings or momenta, you bring them and hit the M2 brain and let them act mm -hmm. on it. So if you don't like them, act on, on, on them two brains, then you recover the full algebra, I guess. So in some I, I'm, I'm confused. I'm confused because uh, a priori it's not clear to me why the same deem should represent the M2 brain and five brain algebras. And it's not, till it, it's not fully the same. If you look at the Fock representation of deem, which is the one from fives, the folk representation has a one central charge non-zero and the other zero. So the central charges that they, I think what they want to be is the actual brain charges that that tells you which brain you have. So you somehow can't get away with it. I mean, get enough, away from it. Yeah, funnily enough, they they still work for them. They work, work for both, so the same algebra with the proper central charges seem to work for both M2s and M5s. And why is that is not clear to me? Well, maybe somehow the algebra is bigger in some trivial sense in that, you know, you also have an additional generator, which is, which just keeps track of the bulk charges and you have to tell it what it is. I, <laughs> I'm not a particular algebraically minded person, so I'm not sure if it's necessary, natural to an algebra, but I, I think the most interesting thing would be to understand whether all of your co-products actually are just somehow naturally come out of this thing you are yeah no that's right that's right i believe they should be but it requires a bit of work uh, especially this a goes to a tensor uh, w infinity uh, but you explain very nicely what it should be it's, it's a very pretty picture kind of <laughs> at a point where you have four legs what else can it be but an r matrix yeah it's Maybe a bit confusing right. because Right. Uh, right. There is, you know, by going from C to C star, you get something which has four legs. But uh, naively here, I would get something like A goes to A tensor of W tensor of W opposite. Yeah. And I need to convince now, convince myself that this is the same as something that intertwines A tensor of W and W tensor of A. 
So it requires sort of reorganizing things a bit. So there is a bunch of equations and they need to be reorganized a little bit. They are the same linear combinations of these equations, but... Um, so it's like- At the same time, it's possible that pe people in Dingyu or Haral literature have, well, okay, the literature is huge, so you don't know. But um, the co-products co I've seen written down there were just so opaque, I couldn't make any sense. Yes, yeah, the co-products would send you something with, with central charge, to something with times or something without, perhaps. Uh, but you'll never be able to get some, some, something which has zero central charge. So that has so probable something that has central charge and something that doesn't. I don't think so. Maybe I'm wrong. But, but what, te what tells you that this other, that you, you don't have really a natural time ordering. So it might just be that it's A tends to W to A tends to W, which is more natural, maybe. No, I did, indeed. So I think four leg things are. Sorry, so, so to, to get the relation, I, I will get. It's probably useful to go step by step. By the way, I didn't discuss C times C star. C times C star is kind of interesting. Because if M2 brains are wrapping the C star factor, then you should get standard W infinity on C star. So just the mod algebra W infinity. On the other hand, if they wrap the C, the C factor, you should have a sort of a vertex algebra version of Q deform W infinity. So it's funny, the usual Q deform W infinity is modes on a cylinder, right? Is the deformation of modes on a cylinder. But is there sort of a, w, a Q deform W infinity on a plane? Um, well, there is. Right. Um, so it's related to the fact that, um, okay, in, in um, the, the Knizhik zemological equation, okay, let me not go from double, talk about double algebras, but, um, but it's the same fact. It's, it's, it's not many different. It has two different Q deformations. Q deformation breaks conformal symmetry. So mm -hmm. um, as soon as you Q deform, whether you're on a cylinder or on a plane, it makes a difference. And I think uh in all these cases basically uh one so what, what happens is that um uh you either get something which is essentially has conformal symmetry but on a cylinder mm -hmm. or uh you get a q deformation of something on a plane right so that there are shifts yeah it's That's like right. a and, and it's a nice yeah. translation yeah. and not the yeah yeah, so I, I would I would like to understand a bit better this intermediate case where you have a an H bar deformed W algebra. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think it's fundamentally really all that interesting. I, I think you were on C star times C star origin was everything. Mm -hmm. So once you understand that, then you can take limits. But yeah. Uh, I don't see that it buys some. It might be useful as an intermediate intermediate kind of computational step. Uh, Um, yeah, I just wish that, that the dim was a little bit easier to present or work with. Uh, it's such a scary, <laughs> scary, such a scary algebra. Uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know how to concisely think about I it. I think may, maybe what you're doing is, uh, in some sense, following physics would be best because the, the reason, it's a beautiful theory and it's a beautiful set of questions. It can't have an ugly, unwieldy answer. There's maybe somehow one still looking at it from some, some perspective and it is missing and everything will fall into place. <laughs> like the beautiful story that you told us today. So everything somehow falls into place. <laughs> yeah, I th yeah, I feel, I feel comfortable about the infinity now. <laughs> I think there are many more things that will also fall, but you know, pieces are falling into place. So that's beautiful. Yeah, really. Yeah, I'm. I'm really curious about the the local P one, uh, local P one times P one. So yeah, the, the things in internal phases. I I think this is really an important step. I, I think this is going to be hard, in particular because, well, okay. So, so maybe people... P one times P one is 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 maybe fine. It's the I think there's a troublesome story in the whole um, 
uh, Donaldson, Thomas, you find topological string world, which is that, um, that the right way of thinking about it is the thing that Nekrasov and, and, and Okunkov wrote down, the theory which you know, does not use this refined vertex. And refined, refined vertex is some kind of, you know, it, it's something one figured out by, you know, taking things apart and by brute force. It's mm -hmm. not a very natural object. But anyway, P times, P1 times P1 may be good enough for, for the kinds of question you're I mean, asking. That would be interesting, I think, to get yeah. situation theory. And, uh... Yeah, I, I need to I need to learn the dimer description of this uh, of this box counting uh, because uh, I mean I, I don't know, is there a yeah no, I don't know so I understand, I understand that there is there are generalization of these Donaldson Thomas or both Panay Thomas combinatorics which use dimers. Right for 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 some toy Calabi house. Oh no, there's. Uh, I think the better thing is the. Well, uh, there it is. Um, this is the story that Yamazaki developed, uh, mm -hmm. and well, using the work of Reinecke, which right. is um, I. I mean, you can translate it into dimers, but it's much more natural to just think about modular quiver representations. All oh, right, right. right. Then you get colored. No, um, colored vertices. That, that's that's really pretty, and and it might something that might actually come out of. Actually, maybe that's the way of going about it. Mm -hmm. That that's the place where it would actually be not too hard to do. In fact, it wouldn't be hard to do at all. So it's then you get a very simple generalization of the kind of thing that um, Miroslav did with uh, with Soibelman. You just orbifold. Mm -hmm. So you want to do, for example, p one times p one or or c three. You just orbifold the D3 brains. And mm -hmm. you can just get everything just generalize it. So that's easy. And then uh, and then and then the question becomes, okay, so how do you turn on breathing modes? And that can be done. But, mm -hmm. but I think at these orbifold points, um, you you already would get a generalization of the story. Once you get the sort of the M2 brain algebra, I think that uh, yeah, that would be the even the algebra for a single M2 brain would probably be the, enough to bootstrap the whole thing. Uh, so this is, would be easier. This this kind of story would be easier for M5 brains and would become real. I don't quite see what, was good, what would happen for M2 brains. Something nice must happen too, but it's not immediately obvious how it would go. Now like, there are M2 brains labeled by the external legs, right? Because they can wrap any toric line. Yeah, right. That's right. And these will be different line defects. Yeah. Um, and the confusing thing is that now there will be sort of local operators, which are finite time two brain segments. Not local operators, sorry, they will be particles. So the, 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 the thing that becomes confusing is that now you have a theory which actually has particles moving yeah. about, not just ghosts. Right. So the whole causal duality idea, I don't know how it's going to work. I think that's the big, the big, the big difference. That as long as you have no faces, well, actually, yeah, I don't know. Even for the conifold, I still, I still would like to understand what the role is of the. I don't think we understand them true Do we understand them true algebra for the conifold? I don't think so. I don't think so either. Is the M cube brain algebra the thing that is sometimes called cohomological Hall algebra? Or is it a different thing? No, it's it's very different thing. So, so both the, the, the algebra A and the W infinity are different doubles of the cohomological Hall algebra. But the cohomological Hall algebra is just like one half of the uh, of all the algebras involved. And in order to, to get A and W and all this non-trivial structure, you need to take one more extra step that is highly non-trivial. Uh, whose geometry I, I don't fully understand. So far, we've been always like, just adding it kind of by hand. Uh, but the question is how to glue these two together. So it is a different thing. Yes. And I mean, but for it, the it, it's not clear to you from the naive answer would have been for them, Shubha and Adra would be the, the um, how you call it, 
the GL1 slash one, so some GL1 slash one shifted the fine yang yin. But I don't know if that includes everything. Uh, maybe, maybe it does. And you know, and the W algebra should become this GL1 slash one version of W algebra. Uh, where you have generators which are, you know, GL1 slash one matrices or dimension. Uh, and I think it probably wouldn't be too difficult to work out because in if you know a little bit of algebra <laughs> and a little bit of string theory you can probably patch the two together <laughs> it's just something that makes sense um it's it will be easy again in this q world because um because then you're just talking about d brains and you cannot it's not that difficult to derive what are the d brain interactions i mean it's just they're just d brains so you know the spectra like you know that which open strings are stretching between them mm -hmm. um, so you, you don't need to know representation theory, you could derive it. You, you, don't, you didn't need to know about screening charges, you didn't need to know about... Um, but uh, Mina, if what you're saying is correct, then, uh, then what Miroslav, I mean, how to say, uh, uh, what Miroslav says, he, he doesn't understand why the algebra he gets is some particular double of the cohomological Hall algebra. And the procedure you're describing I don't see how it would ever produce something bigger than the cohomological Hall algebra itself. So I think, okay, so, so now we're, you're getting into things where I'm not an expert on it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is one of the many things I'm not an expert on. But uh, um, if one followed um, what, uh, what, uh, what Miroslav did with, um, with, with Jan, or in just a pure double algebra case, not try to do the, um, um, not, 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 not try to generalize this to this fancy case that uh, one is trying to understand now. Um, wouldn't you have run into the same problem of having uh, an algebra too small that you need to double it? In other words, just, you know, yeah, I, think take, I, I, I think I think that I think that's what Miroslav just told us. Right, and so 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 then, <laughs> Andre always wants to say, oh, Kunko, that somehow conservative album and way of looking at things is not, not just not the right one. Um, that that the reason they are getting something too small is that that I feel I should they should be start they should be studying uh, they should be studying uh, the problem from their perspective, and then the problem goes away. So that suggests like it's a problem of maybe more math rather than physics. I feel I shouldn't be saying that, but I agree with you, Mina. Yeah, it, does, does Mina, Mina, do you or Andre or anyone have a concrete proposal about what is the Andre and Nikita version of cohomological Hall algebra? Uh, Oh, uh, good. I have to relocate just for a second. So I'll, I'll be right back. Okay. I, I can tell you three main reason what is uh, what is what is the cohomological Hall algebra missing. Cohomological Hall algebra is telling you something: how to take a bound state of some, say, d four d d zero brains, and how to add d zero brain. And this is a very natural description in cohomological Hall algebra because you know how to embed two matrices into each other. Uh, on the other end, the opposite process where you are trying to remove the D0 brain, which could describe the other half, and then the consistency, how to glue these two parts of the algebra together. This is the missing part from the cohomological Hall algebra. How to remove uh, D0, D0 from D2. Yeah, exactly, yes. I see. Yeah, so, so, uh... I, embarrassingly enough, I never actually thought about that part of Ma Malik and Kunkov's paper, um, because for them, that was kind of an afterthought. Um, but I didn't actually, okay, so, but, but their basic approach, right, is, um, is to just get R matrices from geometry. And once you have an R matrix, you have an action of a quantum group and you're done. Mm -hmm. So how to construct an R matrix is a, 
it requires a story of these stable envelopes and so forth. But um, that's the way of, of thinking about emergence of these, these kinds of groups from geometry. So it's a bit of a different approach. But um, which might actually become much, because for them at the end, um, deriving, deriving um, 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 David's conjecture with AGT um, was somehow the easy piece. It was not the goal, it was the easy piece. So one would have to go back and understand that easy piece. But, but, but the thing you're saying now is, I mean, if the place where stable envelopes live, uh, they live in things like Hilbert scheme of points on C2. So, so they live on the other side, not in the geometry appropriate to the Kalabia. No, but uh, so, so here the analogy is, right? Um, um, well, they would have been studying, if we just, just get double the algebra, you're studying um, modular space of instantons on C2, right? Um, and, and, and fortunately, we do know uh, what's the right generalization of the modular space of instantons on C2 to get these more general algebras, because um, you know, that, that's actually not that, not that hard to figure out. These are these crossed instantons of Nekrasov or they do, they're described by similar quivers. They're just uh, slightly more complicated quivers. What, what I'm saying is that I think, I, I thought the question we were discussing is, um, it, this W algebra, it comes from two places. It comes either from some question about C2 or from some question in the Calabiat. But this C2 right. we're talking about is part of the Calabiat. No, not in the setup we have here. Yeah, I think it's the other. There's the mirror symmetry in there, like it's, it's like the Higgs branch of the 3D theory is, is the space time C2 and the Coulomb branch is a part of the Calabiat. It's like the normal to them. Uh, I, in the sorry, I, I'm, 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 you, your double so algebra we're, comes we're from. At a, we're looking at the Higgs branch algebra of a, of a 3D theory whose Coulomb branch is the transverse geometry in the Calabiano. Sorry, so I'm, I, I just lost you. I thought, I thought we wanted to understand uh, something like N M5 brains on C2. Let's do M2 brains for a moment. Can we not do M2 brains just yet? <laughs> Can we do M5 brains? Well, then I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how to. Sorry, what Miroslav did, right, was. Right, Miroslav was working with the zero brain site in the, the, it's a complicated duality chain. I don't. It's not that complicated, right? I mean, uh, what Miroslav was doing is saying, oh, let's, sorry, let's just stay with one stack of M5 brains on C2, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, so by some simple string duality, that's the same as a stack of ND4 brains on C2. Mm -hmm. And to describe the stack of the theory on the ND4 brains, um, it's basically quantum mechanics of D zero brains bound to D four brains. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. That, so an analogy of that problem is what Miroslav was studying. Yes. So that's, that's the modular space of instantons. That's the kind of problem that uh, Malik and Okunkov studied. Mm -hmm. That's, and, and, and there they found uh, um, how, uh, they, they, they found this, um, how double the algebra act by, as an application of their, of their machinery. Yeah, now if you take a more general Calabia, what do you do? What you take, so this is what Miroslav explained, right? Um, if, you have, um, if you have stacks of M5 brains on the four different planes, right? So basically, let, let's recall first what the theory on, on the zero brains look like. If you have right. ND4 you, you brains- have, You get a quiver which- You get a quiver, that's right. The zero brain interacting with right. these stacks, yes. And now we say, okay, so now I wanna change my Calabiao from C3 to being something like local P2 or P1, local P1 times P1. So you just orbifold it. And uh, that's particularly easy, or you can replace it by a conifold, which is also so not the hard. Because... I that, that some of those D4s are finite. They don't go to infinity, the ones corresponding to phases. Yeah, so, so, so the they, places they, they where- they on the same footing as the T0 bands. Right, exactly. So, on, so, so what, what this would treat differently from everything else is the, non, the big, heavy, non-compact D4 brains. Yeah. So that, that's what comes for free. But then what do you do with this quiver? Uh, Can you really well, treat 
is not a tridinical for quiver, so you cannot treat it as a malic open curve. A malic open curve do things which are specific to uh, theories with any four supersymmetry. Uh, but they're all balanced quivers, which I, th you're yeah, right, it's you're just, right. It's a little bit outside of their world. It's a little, but but I think what, um, what, what, uh, there's certainly a generalization. Spiked instantons versus instantons, it's just. No, 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 no. The only thing they really, so there are many simpler settings where you already see that sort of um, what somebody needs to do is generalize Malik or Kunkov. Uh, I mean, it's a question for, for, for one of our young mathematicians, I suppose, um, to generalize Malik or Kunkov from uh, geometries which are hypercalar to, <laughs> okay, so I'm not sure how to say it, but basically they are, um, you know, Higgs branches of balanced geometries where, you all, where the arrows are always in the quiver are always paired. Mm -hmm. And then I think it, whatever they have should go through because for example, if you wanted to study, I mean, many questions that come from, from, from your world like, like these, you always get these balanced quivers. So for example, here, oh my God, I hope I did this. No, yeah, I mean, they're always balanced, it, 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 they're it, always it, balanced. Is if you could <laughs> work with if you could if you could work with this any called shoe quivers then uh yeah i think not with any n equals to two but maybe but with the balanced ones you should mm -hmm. be able to and i would be surprised if somehow you you don't end up being so lucky that in everything you ever need in this world are balanced ones I, I suspect that it's true. I'm, I'm happy to, 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 to hope Th This balancing condition is somehow why you get so much representation theory from that, mm. that it's almost like n equals to four ish. And... Mm. Yeah, it would definitely be nice. But I don't understand Malik Okunkov enough to, to say if this, was, if this is reasonable. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, so maybe because it's some small piece, one could, you know, somebody could actually figure out what the algebra actually mm -hmm. is. But um, the other end of it is actually not so hard, I would imagine, to just work it out from string theory, what it should be. Like free field formulas, and one should be able to maybe work out. I mean, I'm, I'm at this point, it's a stretch, but. I, I can't say that I, I see, you know, whether all the steps would work out, but they could. Yeah, the question, yeah, free, you see the free field formalism corresponds to separating stacking of brains into a, a, a unique, a, just one brain. But the point is that I worry about is that maybe that, that individual one brain is already still complicated. Yes, exactly. It's not a free, it's not a free thing. Exactly. Um, and this, At the same time, the places where it interacts with D2 brains or with a, you know, with a, with the M2 brains are just points. And could these interactions know much about local, like global geometry? I don't know. It's, <laughs> it gets, it's getting hard, I, I admit. No, the point no, is that it's the not obvious that it's the compact force. This compact force give me new local operators that they. I don't know how to deal with. At the same time, all this is, is in cases when, when you're just orbifolding, you're just orbifolding. So that can't get complicated. It's just an orbifold. I think something that should be done is to just start, start it as you should get during five dimensions and holomorphically, topologically twist it and see at least what, you know, what operators lie about. Uh, the, the moment here operators which don't take those number one, the whole causal duality becomes much more uh, suspicious. Um, it, it was very specific to a theory which is sort of pure gauge in a sense in the bulk. Uh, how, right. how, in other than sort of being a nice framework to think about this, um, was it really important to have it? For you, I, I can't quite understand. It's, it's much easier to think about algebras and morphisms of algebras than to think about differential graded uh, infinity things, which is what one would have to do, I fear. 
I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how important it was actually. So it's, uh, probably looking at an orthogonal example would help, like this pure C2. Even pure E1. Uh, anyway, I mean, the conifold is like a five dimensional hyper multiplet, right? Uh, coupled to. A six dimensional gauge field into uh, supergravity. And it's okay. Uh, but somehow the twist makes that go multiple and it goes number one thing to uh, the, uh, the bosonic goes number one thing. Just because there is a situ the, the, the ghost number grading is a situ R, that will multiply this doublet of the situ R. I think the part is super so, so biased, it's like chart to under. I, I don't know, I've not looked at the details and I should. Uh, uh, I'm not hearing you actually. Well, I might so, want to think about the, um, the conifold and the P1 and the local P1 simultaneously because they're kind of complementary. Yeah. Anyway, so I think yeah. my family is, uh, is wondering. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> David, thank you so much for, 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 uh, for, for joining us for, for the terrific talk and it's beautiful stuff. So it's. Well, no, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.